welcome. Thank you for attending this workshop sponsored by the Society for Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology, the Children's Trust of Florida, and Florida International University. Uh, what I want to focus on is, in this workshop, is treating adolescents who have anxiety with a focus on developmental issues that are unique to adolescents, that wonderful period of life. <laughs> My favorite period. I had one good day as an adolescent, so I you know, want to make sure kids have more than that. Actually, it was one of my favorite periods of life, so we'll take a, we'll take a long look at adolescence. Um, what we're going to talk about today in this workshop is where it all begins, and we're focusing on anxiety, remember? Treatment as we now understand it in terms of what is effective treatment for children and adolescents with anxiety. There is a separate workshop that Wendy Silverman did on treating anxiety disorders in children that will go into much more detail on that. But I'm going to do treatment where it now stands and then take it to really the specifics of adolescence and the storm and stress of adolescence and how to flexibly apply cognitive behavioral therapy to this specific age group. And I'll present a model that we are working with in our practice um, and in our research that really focuses on adolescents meeting not just the challenges of managing their anxiety, but the challenges of development and what is necessary for them to successfully transition to adulthood. And of course, this is going to involve talking about not just the teenager, but the parents. And we'll, we'll get into that. So where do we all begin? In the beginning, right? Anxiety itself is a developmental issue. Uh, we know that anxiety is normal. It's a normal, basic human emotion. It's there from very early on. In fact, even prenatally, they can uh, register and show um, anxiety responses. And it manifests itself, and we'll talk about this in a minute, in different ways at different ages as life progresses. It's multifactorial. There's a whole lot that is involved in anxiety and ways that it comes to the forefront for an individual. Um, and it's transactional, meaning that it's occurring in an interpersonal and environmental context. So we have to look at that. The developmental aspects um, expected and normal at different ages, but that temperament sets the stage. And it sets the stage in that children who have more of an anxious attachment and their temperament is much more of the anxious type of temperament, they tend to more readily uh, be conditioned and uh, manifest anxiety over time. Um, some other developmental aspects are this progression of expected anxious, fearful responses at different ages of development. Now, interesting, all children express fear. In the preschool ages, we know it's fear mainly of things that are imaginary or of specific objects or situations. Fear of strangers, so the separation anxiety of being left with a babysitter or uh, going to daycare or preschool, um, fear of small animals and uh, dogs barking, um, imaginary situations, what could get me in the middle of the night. And there are m many, many, many wonderful children's books, of course, that are written and capitalize on these kinds of situations. Um, the one I love from the Sesame Street group is The Monster Under My Bed. Right, that illustrates the fear of the unknown and uh, you know, an imaginary situation and then how that fear is conquered in the character. Um, in grade school, as we're hitting more towards first grade, the focus of fear in the normally developing child is changing. And now it goes towards health concerns and harm, fear of thunder and lightning, fear of doctors and dentists, um, scrutiny and competence, uh, getting things right, having everything. So this is where um, 
you know, what's in my backpack is important, the fear of, of not bringing the right pencils to school, different things like that take over. Um, and then by adolescence, fears are changing to more fears of social adequacy, fears of their performance and how they're doing in situations involving evaluation, school, friendships, and such. And these are normally developing fears. They come on for a little bit, and they go off. We know that the number of fears declines with age. So younger children have more fears than adolescents. And we also know, and this holds up cross-culturally, work by Tom Ollendick, Neville King, and others over many years has shown um, that girls manifest more fears than boys. But again, this, can decli this declines as age goes on. And this whole, all of this holds up cross-culturally in different surveys that have been done around the world. The interesting thing is when you look at the anxiety disorders and when they manifest, we see another, a similar thing. In the early childhood ages, um, spheres of specific situations and objects, the simple phobias set on, as well as separation anxiety. These anxiety disorders come on early. Next is the middle age, or middle childhood age. The anxieties that come on there, you tend to see obsessive compulsive disorder manifesting by seven, eight years of age, and generalized anxiety disorder. The worry warts, as parents call their children. What if? What if we go on vacation and we get lost? What if you get sick and then there's no one to help you? What if I go to school and this year the teacher is really mean and she doesn't like me? You know, the what ifs, all right? These are uh, grade school concerns, so you get GAD and OCD. And then by adolescence, what is hitting is social phobia and panic disorder. Um, so social phobia being excessive concern and, and anxiety around being negatively evaluated by others, rejected, humiliated, embarrassing oneself in such a way that you can't face people, um, fear of failing in a um, open way in front of everybody and then being labeled and, uh, you know, as the failure. Um, and then, of course, panic, which is a fear developing of these internal sensations, heart racing, shakiness, um, and the panic, the focus of those fears, which are internal, is that some, this means something is terribly wrong with me. In adults, we classically hear heart, heart attack, stroke. This is what the panic fear is about. In adolescence, it's about being ill. And maybe they can conceptualize heart attack or such, but it's about getting so sick that I'm going to fall out and do something that embarrasses myself in front of others. But it's the fear of, the imp of what happens with these sensations. And these are mainly the disorders that are, uh, occur then in adolescence. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, can onset any time because it has an identifiable event um, that has happened to the child or the adolescent. But the, so, it, so the anxiety disorders themselves map onto the vulnerabilities of normally developing kids in terms of fear. The risks for anxiety are many. The risks for anxiety, you can line up one, two, three, all of them, but risks are out there. And the typical child is weathering these risks. A uh, child who has certain factors of resiliency, social support, uh, certain you know, support from family, and the way that their psychological development is going, they're going to weather these risks. Um, and not develop an anxiety disorder. But we do know that there are certain risks then that uh, lend themselves to a higher probability of anxiety occurring, giving them lining up. Number one thing we know, first of all, is that in certain anxiety disorders, there tends to be um, more likely uh, familial aggregation than not. So panic disorder, social phobia, obsessive compulsive disorder, and certain specific phobia of blood phobia, for example, these tend to run in families. Um, run more or less to a degree of manifesting at a clinical level or severe clinical level, but you know, you tend to see that in twin studies you could see the family aggregation as well as in um, following families over time. 
So there's some genetic component. And whether what, what the understanding at present is, is it probably makes it easier for the, um, the in, nervous system to respond in an anxious way, that is to set off the fight or flight response of the amygdala and set off all the different types of pathophysiological um, variables, release of certain hormones and various this and that that causes the anxiety response, whether it's in a panic, all or none, or if it's in a future-oriented state of tension. Um, this vulnerability is genetically passed on. Temperament, as I mentioned, which is that first look at personality of the infant. The inhibited temperament has been associated with panic and with social phobia. Um, but also, you know, just in general, it could, uh, certain temperaments, you know, more predictive of other types of childhood disorders uh, too. So temperament's something that we take a look at. And I think one of the keys in terms of temperament um, when working with families with very young children and and uh, even new, you know, mothers, is helping the child, the, the infant and toddler who has um, a difficult, anxious temperament, teaching them self-soothing, teaching it early. And this is one of the things that you probably you will hear in Wendy Silverman's presentation in her workshop. These kids need to learn, the kids who have anxiety, but all children, need to learn how to soothe themselves, do it young, and have them adapt their soothing um, activities and the things that they do for that as they age to be age appropriate. All right, so teaching self-soothing is important for kids with difficult temperament. Early experience. Can you give an example of self-soothing, but I don't know, pick an age level, maybe well, middle school? Um, well, uh, you know, examples, of course, in, in uh, early childhood, are sometimes sucking the thumb. Some kids will do that. But, you know, parents will give children uh, something soft and fuzzy. That's teddy bears, you know, to cuddle with and, you know, stroking themselves with that as they're falling off to sleep. Then we can teach you some children uh, who get overstimulated in, for, for instance, kindergarten and first grade during free time, free play times and all. You can see them remove themselves, sit with a book and read. That is a soothing method. Um, you, what we tend or are, are teaching our 8, 9, 10, 11 year olds are some meditation strategies and using, um, sorry, teaching meditation strategies. So mindfulness meditation of sitting, um, learning how to calm their mind, take deep cleansing breaths to calm the activation that they may feel from wherever it's coming from, a test being put in front of them by the teacher, some kids who are acting up and teasing to find that calm place. That's a soothing technique. So, and, and one of the biggest things for children is routines. Reasonable routines for getting themselves ready to bed, getting themselves up and ready in the morning, um, one of the most portable soothing techniques that I ask teachers to make part of their routines in the classroom is when children come in from a recess or from lunch is for everyone to do belly breathing, quiet belly breathing. When I was growing up, the, the nuns used to have us put our heads down on the table and just for, you know, and breathe quietly. Well, maybe it was their form of what nowadays we do, deep diaphragmatic breathing where there you picture a balloon in your belly, you put your hand over, uh, put your pinky on your uh, navel, so your hand is covering your belly, there's a balloon there with a tube going all the way up your throat, and now inhale and inflate your balloon, exhale to deflate your balloon. We do this to the count of three. One, two, three. Pause, relax, two, three. We do this about five to ten times. I teach teachers to do this. It settles their class. Instead of them having to say, all right, calm down, quiet, you know, we do belly breathing. So those are different types of soothing techniques. We make soothing boxes for our children in therapy, which uh, involve a shoe box, and in it, they'll put things for them that are soothing to them. 
pictures that are meaningful. Um, rocks, we get rocks and put essential oils, so maybe a lavender scented stones, if that's what they like, or vanilla is a big one for some kids. A little pad, a notepad with um, pencils or crayons that they can draw with. Um, so a piece of their baby blanket. You know, these are different things that go into each soothing box is individually made by the children to be meaningful for them. And we make them smaller. We make travel soothing boxes as well as we make the stashes they could leave in their bedroom. But. So the question is, how old is too old to have things like a piece of your baby blanket um, or something like that? Um, my sister's not going to like this one. She has her teddy bear. She's in her 40s. Um, <laughs> going to love me for that one. Is able to leave it at home and have other tools? Well, but this is the thing, you know. So taking a piece of something rather than like being Linus and carrying that blanket everywhere you go, it depends on, on the individual. And we move towards um, what is age appropriate and what, you know, listen, when you go off to college, you're packing things that are making you think about home. And, you know, and it's everything from your favorite, you're taking your favorite pillow, you know, you're taking a stuffed animal, you're taking pictures of the family. So it's, it's age appropriate, but you're right, we, what you have to watch for is you don't want them having something that they're pulling out in the middle of class <laughs> that then everybody's looking at, you know, what's the kid over in the corner with, you know, the blankie. But, you know, so make it age appropriate. But self-soothing is so important and has to really be laid down. And with adults that I work with with anxiety disorders, they're lacking in those self-soothing skills. So we have to watch that. And I think it's very important to teach parents because they have to stay focused and calm while they're dealing with all kinds of things happening with their children. So early experiences, experiences in the environment from um, being scared at times about certain things, observing things that they're not comfortable observing, whether it's another child being yelled at or various things like that, the context within fa where families live. Don't exclude the issues of environment, what the neighborhood is like, what the school is like, what the classroom environment is like. Different things will affect the child. Um, of course, uh, disruptions in families, uh, whether it's moving, whether it's divorce, um, whether it's different types of family dysfunctions that all of these early experiences affect children, right? And, and those who are at risk for, you know, this is a risk factor for anxiety moving along, as well as some other disorders, depending again on what lines up for the child. Parenting style has been studied uh, pretty extensively. And there's two types of parenting style that we're going to talk about today when it comes to the anxiety disorders. One is the overprotective parent. Parental overprotection is a major risk factor for anxiety and a major variable involved in the maintenance of anxiety in children. So here's the scenario. Your child is four. She goes to a little daycare program. She comes home crying. Sasha and Kate and Joanna wouldn't play with me today. And she's upset. And you, your heart breaks when she's crying like this. So you cuddle her, you sit with her, you talk about, oh, maybe there was something going on. Uh, that's not nice. But tomorrow when mommy goes in with you to drop you off, we're going we're gonna to have everybody play nicely. And you intervene for your four-year-old. So you go in, and maybe you've brought little treats for the kids. You know, you get Joanna and Sasha and Kate playing with your daughter again. Um, or if it's a little more involved, you might get the teacher involved. That's at four years old, or five in kindergarten. But then at eight years old, your daughter's coming home. Well, the girls wouldn't talk to me at lunch, and they're being mean. Mm. What are you doing there? And at 10 years old, and at 12 years old, what happens with an overprotective parent is their child's distress and upset is working on their parenting to fix the situation. And while it may be appropriate at four or five, eh, it's getting less appropriate that you intervene and fix it up 
call the other parents, may arrange these play dates, get everybody together. You know, it becomes inappropriate as time goes on because what? Your daughter needs to learn how to manage this situation. So we're going to talk about that, these kinds of things, especially with adolescents, obviously, as we move along. But that's the overprotective parent, and then they're overcontrolling. Overprotection is they're soothing them, and then overcontrolling. Um, other ways you find overprotection are parents who keep doing things that developmentally the child should be doing for themselves. So engaging with teachers about uh, a test grade or the way they graded something. Ah, oh, you know, middle school is when children really should start trying to do that. You know, there's different things. Parents staying too involved for too long rather than teaching the child and modeling for them how to handle it. Um, and parents will, for example, we hear often with parents of separation anxious children, the strategies. We don't tell her we're going out and what we do is we have the babysitter come when she doesn't see the baby. When she's taking her bath, the babysitter comes in the house and hides in our bedroom. And when she is all dressed and ready for bed, we tell her to go in the bed and we leave for our dinner. And then the babysitter shows up in there. Okay, you know, because they don't want to upset her ahead of time. The separation anxious child will, don't go mommy, I want to be with you. And so they learn strategies to try to get away from that. Or there are the ones who were giving her a complete itinerary of where we are. And of course, we talk to her every 15 minutes. And this is no, no kidding. So these strategies, this is overprotectiveness in that the parent is trying desperately to keep that child's anxiety at bay. Um, but the child is not really learning how to manage the fact mom and dad are going to have plans to go out. You know, so there's different ways that that happens. So parenting style is a big one. Coping resources, how the child develops and learns coping resources of their own. Age-appropriate skills for, for problem solving, for approaching situations, for um, interacting with others. These resources for coping, for handling disappointment and things, these are very important. And they typically occur and, and develop as time goes on, but they may be weak or there may be things that get in the way of that based on temperament, um, environmental events, different things. And then, of course, we have to watch parental anxiety and parental depression are both predictive of child anxiety in their children. Many, many years of studies following families, adults with anxiety disorders and following what happens to their kids, adults with depression and seeing what happens to their children, is the development of anxiety disorders are there. <coughs> so these are the risk factors. <coughs> we expect that all children <coughs> are going to experience anxious events. They're going to have anxiety in relation to everything from <coughs> starting school, taking tests, uh, going to social events, um, failing something or losing things, environmental events that occur. <coughs> I'm losing my voice already, and we're only 15 minutes in. <coughs> but these transient episodes are expected, and, and they really cause little interference in functioning. The child's upset for a little brief period of time in the moment, but it tends to resolve. And it resolves you know, as the event passes and as the child stays in the event. Right? Sticks with it. Um, and actually, by staying in the event, whatever else is happening around them can continue to occur, and usually it becomes reinforcing. Staying in school, dealing with the friends, makes friendships. Uh, you know, staying with the situation, they learn how to manage it, and it's overshadowed by competency feelings, which are reinforcing, but then also what's going on in the environment around them. If you take a child who's afraid of noises and crowds and keep them away from Fourth of July events, family gatherings for holidays, picnics that the school puts on, they don't learn how to accommodate to these situations. So transient episodes occur as long as the children are sticking with it. Uh, they, they deal with it. 
What sets off anxiety then in any of these given situations are a number of variables. One is the physical sensations. When something happens, you know, car backfires. You have a physical reaction to that noise. Or when you're driving down the street in a car and you're going through your neighborhood and suddenly a child on a bicycle darts out in front of you, you slam on the brakes, but at the same time, you are breathing in quickly, you're tensing, there's a release of adrenaline, there's a physiological reaction occurring. Anxiety is accompanied by that. If you're worried about paying bills and different things that are going to happen, an upcoming doctor's appointment, whatever, you are, you have low levels of, of hormones that are being released and you're in a state of tension. It's a physiological event that's occurring over time. So physical feelings are there. And sometimes we recognize them more readily than others if we're feeling flushed, if we're shaking, we have butterflies. Kids are able to identify these sensations. Also, what could set off anxiety are emotions. Embarrassment, if they're being teased, um, or if they're being yelled at, or if they've made a mistake, frustration, anger. Different emotions can also become scary in and of themselves to the child. Emotions will set off anxiety. Their behavior, and this is the big one, the more they withdraw and learn to avoid situations that provoke anxiety, their behavior then begins to set it off. Right? Any approach and then second thought, whoa, they get an anxiety response and they back off again. And these are all tied, of course, to external situations, things that are going on or supposed to go on that they have learned to think about in negative ways. So their thoughts. Typically, I can't. It'll harm me in some way. I won't know what to do. You know, something along the lines of this is not going to be safe for me in some way. So I have to either avoid it, get out of it, endure it with distress, and then leave it. We'll talk about a lot of examples of these as we go through the day. So what's the difference between normal fears that come and go at different ages and an anxiety disorder? We tend to look at, number one, the level of avoidance. How much avoidance is occurring, how much escape uh, the child demonstrates. Um, so those tantrums to get out of going to school, separating from the parents, having to give an oral report, whatever it might be. So there's that. Um, how much time the teenager who's socially phobic spends in their room and at home as opposed to with peers, right? Uh, how much time a child spends erasing and erasing and rewriting and erasing and not really completing and, and saying, this is it, I'm done with my homework and letting it stand. These are all avoidance. The interference in their functioning, how these behaviors and these anxieties are getting in the way of doing what they should be doing. Attending school, hanging out with friends, you know, getting along with family. Within, you know, there's going to be fighting and arguing. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, to what degree and how much this is really disrupting. Do the parents realize that all of their struggles with their kid are around trying to get that child or that teenager to do something they're supposed to be doing? Um, but the child is frightened and afraid and anxious about it? Are they constantly reassuring and trying to reassure so that the child will approach and do the thing? How much interference in functioning? And when we see the interference in functioning really reach, you know, epic proportions, we see it with kids who refuse to go to school because of anxiety. And that, you know, when they are not wanting to enter a classroom, Classrooms are filled with, they have negative events within classrooms. Not everyone's going to pass the test. Not everyone's going to have the answer when they're called on. Not everybody in the class is going to be the best of friends. You know, stuff's going to happen. Not every teacher is going to be the most perfect teacher. You know, whatever. But for the majority of what's going on in school is positive, neutral to positive. But children with anxiety will zero in 
on the negatives and when they stop wanting to go and they're really ramping up the tantrums and the avoidance and stuff, there's so many, so many levels of dysfunction that will set in, academic, social, interpersonal, everything. So that interference in functioning is huge by the time the uh, uh, school refusal sets in due to anxiety. We also look at distress, how upset they get. How distressed does the child, teenager, actually get and how it's manifested? And you will see it um, in somatic complaints and physical feelings. Treated, I've treated so many children. And, it, and this actually is more in the teenagers um, who vomit due to anxiety. They're so physically wrapped up that they vomit, 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 vomit. Um, and, you know, it's not an eating disorder thing. They're not trying, and it's not due to an illness, and they, they're cleared by the GI specialist, but they get so anxious that they can't hold anything down. Uh, we see a lot of that kind of thing happening in terms of the level of distress that they experience. And then, of course, you see the crying and stuff. And then the duration. Most anxiety disorders have to be sticking for at least six months. Now, an interesting thing the DSM-5 is going to be changing some of these things. Um, it's all going to be more, it's supposed to be going towards a more developmentally informed system, much more dimensional than categorical, um, and some of these time limits may be changed. But we tend to look at um, stable anxiety for six months that's sticking as not a developmental transitional issue like, you know, entering adolescence and having more of a heightened fear of other people or concerns of what people think. That, you know, when you enter school, at the beginning of the school year, we see kids' anxieties tend to be a little higher. But by October, they're in the swing of things. If that's not happening and, those, and the, the, the adolescent is still as anxious as can be, in fact, it's picking up steam two months, three months, four months down the road, you know, you're looking at an anxiety disorder. So we look at these criteria. Avoidance, interference, distress, and duration in determining is it an anxiety disorder versus a, a you know, normal fear. DSM-4 has quite a few anxiety disorders. Um, separation anxiety, social phobia, and generalized anxiety um, are the most common amongst children and adolescents. <clears throat> and then you see panic disorder, agoraphobia, obsessive compulsive, the specific phobias and PTSD, these make up the categories of DSM anxiety disorders. They have selective mutism separated in parentheses. It's not in the anxiety disorders category, but predominantly what we see are children who refuse to speak outside of the home um, tend to be anxious about the act of speaking. And, you know, the interesting thing is if they've been able to do this for a long period of time. Their identity becomes the girl who will not speak. So changing that means a big deal. It's changing who I am. So when we have children presenting to us who have been allowed by systems not to talk all through elementary school, and I've had several of these cases, and they're going to be going to a different high school, you know, to a new high school, and the high school counselor and the principals have caught wind of this, and they're like, no, 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 she must speak. She's been passed along. There's been different things that families have done. Worked with one girl who was an eighth grader who was allowed to bring in for oral reports a tape-recorded oral report of her mother speaking her book report. And she was given the same grade as the other kids in the class who spoke and gave their oral report. Well, there's a whole system collusion to maintaining that, that selective mutism with that particular child. And she's very typical of, of the children who come in late into the early adolescent years because when they're going to go to a new school, it's going to be different. And sure enough, the high school is telling the family, uh -uh, she's not going to get grades in that way. She has to perform. Um, and the big thing for her is, you know, that would mean a complete change of who she is because she became a little bit comfortable with the anxiety of speaking because she was allowed to. Yes? I had a case at a high school, it was a 15-year-old boy, and 
and we were thinking collective mutism, and really what it turned out to be was uh, uh, clinical depression, and we ended up paper acting him, and, and he was. Uh -huh. But it, for for a long, I mean, it's a child that stonewall, and it gets very frustrating for the staff involved to the point where it's like you know you're being disrespected because you're not answering like direct questions. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it, it was it was really a. a Right, or social phobia, you know, it, it, they, they tend to present, right, so the, the absence of speaking is the issue. What is the motivating condition behind it? And if it's a child who has absolutely no, or teenager, is getting no reinforcement and can't imagine, you know, any kind of reinforcement for speaking because they're so depressed, they've lost interest in things around them. You know, depression certainly could be, and the breakup of a girlfriend. Now, now teenagers, breakups precipitate a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. Well, we'll talk about those as we move along too. So these are the anxiety disorders. Um, the child anxiety triad, these three, separation, social, and GAD, tend to hang together. They tend to co-occur um, with one another, so they're highly comorbid. They run a similar course over time, which is they stick and they develop into, you know, adult versions of these disorders. Um, and they tend to respond similarly to cognitive behavioral treatments and medication treatments. So in clinical studies that have been done over the years, Wendy Silverman, who is here at Florida International University and has a, a child anxiety and phobia program here, she has um, run some clinical treatments and developed treatments for some of these disorders. Same with Philip Kendall at Temple University. He has the coping cat, and we'll talk about that in a second. They tend to treat these three disorders together um, and have found methods that all three respond similarly to these methods. Yes? What would be typical meds you would give them? Oh, we'll talk, about, um, we'll talk about treatment as we move along here. I'm going to get to the question is what would be typical medications, and I'll, I'll talk about those in a sec. In terms of the prevalence for these disorders, the rated, weighted prevalence rates for 12 months, these are boys separated from girls. You know, the bottom line here, what we see is that these are highly prevalent disorders amongst, this is adolescents. These data come from the National Comorbidity Survey for Adolescents. This was a large epidemiological study that was undertaken several years back um, in adolescents ages 13 to 17, a sample of 10,000, over 10,000 kids uh, contacted randomly, you know, in the way that they s do throughout the country to get a representative sample of U.S. Um, adolescents. And so what we see is highly prevalent in boys, about 18 percent of those, of the four th nearly 5,000 boys in the sample had an anxiety disorder whereas about 31% of girls did. So we're seeing the gender difference already in adolescence, more girls than boys presenting with anxiety. And then what you see amongst the boys is most highly the specific phobias, uh, same thing with the girls, but then look at social phobia at a prevalence rate 6.1 for the boys, 10.6 for the girls. Uh, panic disorder is onsetting, uh, 1.4 for the boys, 2.4 for the girls. Um, and so forth. So but these disorders are highly prevalent in these kids. And then by age, the thing that we see is specific phobia, much like what you see with spheres. They tend to occur more in the younger children and decline with age a little bit. So you have a less prevalence over age with specific phobia. But social phobia picks up more steam. This increases in prevalence as you go from 13 to 17 years of age. Panic disorder, the red line, increases in prevalence. Generalized anxiety disorder, which is worry, increases in prevalence. Agoraphobia pretty much stays about the same. Okay. The other thing we find of these children, these teenagers, is that if you look at any of the kids who have at least one disorder, of any kind. Predominantly, you're finding anxiety. About 27 percent of the adolescents who were surveyed had an anxiety disorder. 
That's more than 8% of ADHD. ADHD was 8%. Mood disorder, depression was 8%. Conduct or uh, oppositional defiant was 7%. Substance abuse at 7%. But 27% of the kids with at least one disorder had an anxiety disorder. These are highly prevalent conditions that occur. The other thing to understand, too, is in comparing anxiety to behavioral problems, which is the blue line, uh, mood, other uh, greenish looking line, and then pink is substance abuse. This is patterns of onset over adolescence, uh, or over childhood and adolescence, starting at age four. Anxiety starts early. You get a sharp peak between four years of age and 12 is when these anxiety disorders are setting themselves in. And then through adolescence, they stay the most prevalent disorder. But look at substance abuse, of course, four, five, six, you're not getting substance abuse. But suddenly at age 12, you're getting a peak all of a sudden, 12, 13, 14, where substance abuse is kicking in. You also see with the mood disorders here, less in terms of mood disorder in childhood, but adolescence is where this picks up steam. And the behavior disorders have a steady incline from childhood into adolescence. Uh, so we look at patterns of onset because if you understand these, of course, when a child comes in, like a child like you were just reporting on, who's not speaking, he's a teenager, what's going on? Well, you can't just simply assume selective mutism because he is a teenager. And we know this is the time that's it's ripe for depression. It's ripe for anxiety, social anxieties. So what might be going on? We look at patterns of onset. It's ripe for substance abuse. There's different things to think about depending upon the age of the child. So these prevalent statistics and onset Lifetime cumulative curves are very important. The other thing we know about with anxiety, and especially when we're working with our adolescents, we have to think about anxiety has been shown in study after study of adults and adolescents over the years that it is a gateway disorder. It's known as a gateway. Anxiety starts early. It is there before anything else. It picks up speed as it moves along. And what happens is it precedes the onset of substance abuse and depression. The longer studies have shown, the longer you suffer with anxiety, the more likely you are to become depressed by adolescence and to start using substances. And it's been associated with an increased probability of an initial onset of substance use disorder and places youth at risk for at least one form of substance use, nicotine, use and dependence, alcohol, or drug. And the anxiety disorders that do this mostly are separation, social, post-traumatic stress disorder, panic, and specific phobias. Specific phobias wind up being implicated in everything. This is an interesting thing. Uh, Ron Kessler is an epidemiologist and public health guy at Harvard University, has run the biggest epidemiological studies in the United States for the last 25 years. And just heard him give a talk and have looked at the data they have where he has shown that specific phobia early in childhood predicts every mental disorder in adults. Talk about a gateway. Now here's the problem as a child psychologist when I listen to that. How many parents have come in, and when you do an evaluation, you hear the child has had phobias. They've been a frightened child, but the parents have been told, or had been told, don't worry, it's a phase. She'll grow out of it. Well, what Kessler's data is saying is that it might, it might not grow out of it. And in fact, not just not grow out of it, it may grow into something else. So we can't treat anxiety in children and especially the specific phobias where you just say, oh, when we go to grandma's house, she'll put the dog in the basement. And well, you don't have basements in Florida. You'll put the dog in, the, in a closet. And, you can't treat it that way and think that the child's going to be OK. And one day, they're going to wake up and play with grandma's dog. It's not going to happen. So they're not innocuous conditions. Highly prevalent. They significantly impair functioning across social, academic, family, and independent functioning. Uh, they're comorbid with mood and substance use disorders, and they persist into adulthood. 
anxious kids become anxious adults. And an interesting study that was done um, looking at who utilizes, who utilizes mental health services over the long term as adults, you would think you'd find depression. Is the depressed adults are the ones who stick with and stay in the mental health care system. Anxiety in childhood confers a 23-fold increase of staying, odds of staying in treatment over the long term in adulthood, whereas depression in childhood confers or adolescence a 14-fold increase. So this may reflect the fact that anxiety tends to stick with you, whereas depression in individuals goes ups and downs. It's episodic, whereas anxiety is continuous. So we got to watch. It's people with anxiety who are needing and utilizing health care. Although when you look at health care utilization statistics, most people don't get treatment who need it. But they do stay dependent on systems, family systems, and also social welfare systems because they don't function well. Treatment of anxiety in youth. Good news. I got good news. I promise you I have good news. Anxiety is highly treatable. Hey, I'm a, I like to win. Now, I'm not Charlie Sheen. I'm not winning. But I like to win. And so I like working with these conditions because when you turn around an individual suffering with anxiety, wow, you've opened up a life to them. And it is really a phenomenal thing to experience with a family, with a child, with an adult. When they are feeling good about themselves again and when they are doing things that they were afraid to do. And one of the things I love getting are postcards from people who travel, who haven't traveled, and you know, kids who send me pictures of themselves. I worked with um, a young girl in Kentucky who will always be in my heart, who when she came to me, was brought to me at the age of 16. And she had early onset multiple phobias from early childhood and OCD by the time she was six, seven. The parents did not open a window in their house from the time she was around six years of age. Kentucky's a beautiful place, nice weather, no window open, because of her fear of what would come in the house, germs, bugs, and things. I got, and that, I had her at 16. From that OCD, social phobia also developed, intense fear of other people. By eighth grade, she had been hospitalized twice. She was no longer in a public school where she had been. She's a wonder, she was a wonderful student. She was in a day treatment type of school setting. And so here she was. I mean, to me, she was like in a cocoon. She couldn't do anything. Imagine how impaired she was with this OCD that she was suffering with. She had a retainer she had to wear. She couldn't put it in her mouth or take it out of her mouth. Her mother had to do it because of her fear of contaminating herself. She couldn't turn the water on and off in her shower. Her mother had to do it for her. So she was so sheltered um, and overprotected, but the parents, with credit, were trying desperately to get her help, and one treatment after the other wasn't working for her. Um, and then, you know, eventually they got to the Anxiety Disorders Association of America, who they have a referral list, and she was referred to me, and, and we started to work together. We, we worked together. I had one of my students working with her also. This, this is my student of the millennium, Michael Detweiler. I love him dearly. When he did an exposure at her home with this young girl where they finally opened up a window, you know, a window, what do you think was in the window sill? A dead fly. And her initial reaction, of course, was, <gasps> what do you think Michael did? He ate it. He ate it. He ate it. <laughs> he ate it. But he demonstrated there's nothing wrong with this. Love this guy. But the thing of it is, all the way through with her was demonstrating for her that things she thought were going to harm her were not. And eventually I had moved back to New, I moved to New York and left Kentucky and stuff. Um, now this is a kid, mind you, three hospitalizations before 16, the home, I mean the schooling in the uh, day treatment center. It, it was the best day of my life when I opened up a letter from her with a picture of her in her college graduation gown. She had gone off to college. That, it means so much when you turn these children around and these teenagers around, you know, to really reclaim their lives and take on a life that some kids in childhood miss because of anxiety. Yes? How do you differentiate like, social anxiety disorder as opposed to uh, agoraphobia? 
Well, the difference, the thing about these different anxiety disorders is the focus of the fear. Anxiety is the common substrate. There is anxiety that is manifesting physically, you're feeling it. There's thoughts that go with it. Behaviorally, you're avoiding. But these thoughts are going to determine which category you're in. The focus of fear and agoraphobia is more that you are going to have physical sensations typically Classically, it's GI, gastrointestinal stuff, or some kind of, you're going to get sick or overwhelmed in a way that you won't be able to control yourself, and you may faint, you may lose control of your bowels, something like that, and hence, you're not traveling comfortably because of that fear. You're not going to places where you might get caught and not be able to escape. That is different from social phobia, which is the fear is of, of social ostracization, embarrassment, humiliation, social failure. Um, that's a very different thing, rejection, humiliation. Uh, separation of anxiety, of course, is the fear that uh, while separated from parents or loved ones, something terrible will happen that will keep you separated forever. You'll get kidnapped, killed, they'll be in a car accident, die. These are the different things. So it's the focus of the fear that determines uh, you know, whether it's generalized anxiety, which is worry about future events, you know, or, you know, or what it might be, all right? So we have three ways that we know are effective in treating anxiety in youth. Cognitive behavioral therapy, which we'll talk a lot about. Medication, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. Or their combination are the three highly uh, researched, well-established treatments for the anxiety disorders. The goals in cognitive behavioral therapy, first and foremost, we're going to educate the patient about what this is. And I'm going to go into the psychoeducation. I'm going to go into how we're doing all this. But we are going to set it up so that the patient understands what's happening with them. And we're going to set it up to understand what is anxiety, where it may have come from, but, more, and, but where it's hanging and why it's hanging in the way that it is now and how cognitive behavioral therapy will address this, the different components of treatment, why we do psychoeducation, why we're going to do cognitive restructuring, what exposure is going to be for. We're going to do all of that in the course of educating the adolescent. How many of you remember the film um, Animal House? <laughs> the opening scene at, of the founder of Faber College is his statue, and it says, knowledge is good. Knowledge is power when it comes to anxiety. Understand it, you can beat it. We are going to teach self-soothing and somatic management. We'll talk about that. That's in our cognitive behavioral therapy approaches. Identify and change anxious thinking, which is critical to the cognitive approach, right? What are you thinking? How reasonable is what you're thinking and how likely is it? And then we're going to go after that and how to change it. Increase their proactive approach behavior. And this is where, when I talk about this young girl, as I just mentioned, where I thought she was in a cocoon, she's a butterfly now. And she's flying everywhere. And that's what's beautiful about treating these kids. So increase their proactive approach behavior so that they learn they can make their way around. And they can handle things that don't go quite right. And we're going to talk about that because this is not Stuart Smalley therapy. Do you know who he is? He, right now, he's a senator from Minnesota. His name is uh, Al Franken. But his character on Saturday Night Live in the 80s was Stuart Smalley. I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. And he would do this whole positive thinking thing. He would sit in front of a mirror, and he would say positive, positive, positive thoughts, and then he'd break down crying. And the classic, the best Saturday Night Live thing I think they ever did with that was they had Michael Jordan come in and help him how to deal with the situation he was dealing with, you know. And, but the increasing proactive behavior and getting into a situation and thinking realistically about how to handle the situation is what's important. And that is what, it's not positive thinking in CBT. It is experiencing a situation while thinking rationally and logically and realistically about what's going on and how I can manage this. So that's very important. Increase healthy problem solving, which especially for adolescents is critical, um, because otherwise you get, mom, 
That means, mom, I don't know how to solve this. I don't want to deal with it. Please do it for me. So we have to increase their problem solving, facilitate their insight and their self-efficacy, which is their ability to work effectively in the world. And then we want to promote generalization and gains over time. So not just that they feel well and do well in your office, but they're functioning well across the board. Now, there are specific interventions that go along with um, these components of treatment that we use. So the very first thing is we build, based on what we learn in our assessment, a fear and avoidance hierarchy. What do you fear? And for each situation that you fear, how much do you avoid it or try to avoid it? And the fear and avoidance hierarchies essentially are like a breakdown into little steps of what it is that they are not able to approach or, and you know. So for example, um, we'll see examples of this as we move along, but for a teenager who is frightened of going up and asking the teacher a question to clarify things, so this teenager sits in class, doesn't raise their hand, they don't get clarification, they don't, you know, they, they're messing up on work because they're not getting what they need to understand the work. We may do a hierarchy of, you know, the first step is asking after class, going up and asking to make an appointment to meet with the teacher. Second step might be meeting with the teacher and going over a specific problem. Third step might be raising your, your hand in class to ask them to clarify and asking a question there. So we build up uh, in the steps from the least anxiety provoking up to the thing that is most upsetting or concerning to them, which might be publicly saying, can you explain that again? Uh, which is hard for the teenager to do. That's a fear and avoidance hierarchy. We use them all across the board. You'll see examples coming up. Um, the psychoed, somatic management, exposure plans. Exposure is the mainstay of treating anxiety disorders. And this is where a therapist who may have been practicing for years and have not used exposure, this is where they sometimes get stuck. Because it does mean not just role play modeling, but it does sometimes mean doing things with the patient in your office that you're not used to doing, such as uh, for an, a patient with OCD, bringing in things that they don't like and working with them on confronting and touching these things and dealing with these things. Example, a uh, teenage boy I worked with with obsessive compulsive disorder, he had a lot of fear of eating things that were contaminated would make him sick, especially E. coli and meat. And so when he was in, I mean, his mother had to cook, his mother said, I might as well have just given him shoe leather because anything she had to make him for dinner or, you know, eating at home had to be cooked, cooked, cooked. And he still would break apart, for instance, the steak and say, Mom, is that, a, is that red? Is it red there? Is that red? Did it, is it, it was constant reassurance seeking, constant checking and shredding of his food. And was, as you can imagine, very interfering and upsetting to him and the family. So what we did was a hierarchy of the level of rareness in food to expose him to. So, you know, from a well-cooked piece of beef all the way up to, you know, sashimi were on his hierarchy. I love treating that kid because I was eating like, you know, let's, you know, we'd order in or the parents would bring in and when he came for session, he came with the stimulus. And, you know, this is something that you could do. You could ask the, the patient themselves can't bring in the stimulus. If they could, they would have eaten it. But if there's a parent, the parent can help or you can order in. I mean, in New York, everything gets five minutes. So I got sushi, I got everything. So we worked on a hierarchy of going up the ladder of exposing him to these things that were less well prepared or cooked through. And at the same time, I was doing it with him. And we, to make it worse, we did stuff like drop it on the floor and then eat it, things like that. Or we went out, one of the things we did was took a walk around the building and we touched things, the side of the building, a New York City bus, shook hands with people we didn't know. And then we got a hot dog at a street vendor. 
Okay? We didn't wash our hands and we didn't check out the vendor and we ate the hot dog. So, but this is, this is what a therapist needs to do in terms of exposure. You gotta think within your environment, what can you do to create as realistic as possible the scenario you need to expose this child or teenager to and do it with them? So what were you doing different that the parent was not? I mean, wasn't the parent saying, look, I mean, yeah, I wasn't need exposing. Well, the parent wasn't exposing. They were overprotecting by making the meat real, you know, they were cooking it, they were, you know, and they were getting into the struggle. What the heck's the matter with you? You know, so there you've got, remember, that's a, they, for, they have developed this problem over his 15 years of life together. They have become involved with this. So it was very difficult. So yes, so I had to separate that, give them a break. I had to work for something like OCD, and it was a teenager. We did a lot of um, teenage-focused intervention alone. And then we'll talk as we move along of how the parents got involved and what we do with them. So how long did you need to work with that child before? He, he was a 10, 12 sessions, an hour to an hour and a half each. Lots of home-based stuff in between that the family got on board with in him right away, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? So did he ever eat stuff and then like spit it out? Oh yeah, he did the whole routine for and stuff. So if it didn't taste right. Part of his homework was, okay, well now you gotta go home and eat that again. Right, but we did it in session first, and this is a key with exposure. We did it in session first. And you know, then the then if you send them home to do it at home, we may and and we'll talk about how to you know really solidify exposures. But we you know I do everything from videotape it so they could watch what they've done, taking pictures of it. You name you know to to make sure that they get it and and also that their anxiety is as has has dropped during the course of the exposure and they're like oh, or they're they're like even though I am anxious I'm doing this and, and I can do it I know I can do it now so it's lear the learning aspect of I'm not automatically dying here because I'm eating this and in fact I feel okay and I'm gonna be okay and act and if I get a little bit from the hot dog guy a little bit of dysentery it'll pass <laughs> it passes the New York, hot, New York hot dogs are okay. I eat New York hot dogs. Um, so exposure is it. That is like the mainstay. And, and then putting into place relapse prevention, which is anticipating how things may be different as you move along. Let me talk about the big study that we did, um, because this is sort of the study from the National Institutes of Mental Health. National Institutes of Mental Health had funded many studies on anxiety in adults and children. But they were CBT studies or they were medication studies. And again, Wendy Silverman and Phil Kendall the, and Debbie Bidell, these are leaders in the child anxiety field in psychology who have had, who had some of the first studies out on developing and treating different types, de developing manuals to treat different types of anxiety disorders. But what happened is by 2001, we knew that CBT worked for most kids who got it. We knew that medication worked for most of the kids who got that. About 50% of all the kids who got treated to 60% to in there did very well, very well. And upwards of 70% did okay, did better than not getting anything. But the question was, okay, what about those kids who weren't benefiting from the CBT or weren't benefiting from the medication? There was never a study that put the two together and tested the combination of the treatments when in fact we know in the community that's what many kids were getting. Their physicians or psychiatrists, usually primary care physicians, but child psychiatrists were prescribing selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, mainly for kids. Um, and they were getting that along with some therapy somewhere. It's typically that. In fact, though, research shows um, public health research shows that the way of treating emotional and mental disorders in the U.S. is medication. People are getting medication, they're not getting CBT. They're not getting, and in fact, you know, data has shown now that there's been an increase in prescribing with an associated decrease in people seeking psychological treatment. 
So, but we knew that we, we had to figure out what about if you gave both. So we took separation anxious, social, and generalized anxiety disorder, children who presented with one or more of these disorders. They could not have major depression. They could not have a developmental disorder that was serious. They couldn't have substance abuse. You know, typical exclusions from these trials. Uh, we had six sites across the country um, that were engaged in this, and we wound up with 488 kids between the ages of 7 and 17 over the six years of the study. They were randomized to cognitive behavior therapy only, medication only, which was sertraline, otherwise known as Zoloft, the combination of the two, or pill placebo. They were followed um, for 12 weeks of treatment. In the 12 weeks, they got 14 sessions of CBT. And they got a titration of their medication up to a certain dosage level. Um, that was over, and, or the placebo. And then uh, they were, those who responded were followed for another six months. But the children who did not respond were sent to treatment in their community. And the children with placebo who were not respond were able to pick whatever treatment they wanted from us and we, we gave it to them, combination or one or the other. At the end of this 12 weeks of the first phase of the study, for the children who received combination of both medication and CBT, 81% of those kids responded. This was significantly better than the other treatments or the placebo. So if you really want, if you, you know, here, if you have a child who's really anxious, really disabled by that anxiety, really impaired and distressed, you may consider the first line might be this, the combination of the treatments. But then what the other thing, though, is the co this cognitive behavior therapy and the sertraline together were not significantly different from one another, but they were significantly better than the pill placebo. So this gives you two other options, actually. So you could go with CBT if it's available, or you go with the medication. But we know that pill placebo did not do much at all for anyone. They didn't get what's called the placebo effect. It really separated. And so these three treatments are active and good. We are studying further now with these children and doing all these extra analyses to figure out if we can make some better, more refined statements about what to do first. Because the questions that aren't answered, really, and we do need more studies on this, is what do you start with? Do you start with the combination? Do you start with one of the monotherapies? Well, we can't answer that question yet. Um, but it's an important question for parents, you know, and for families. But uh, sometimes what goes into decisions on what treatment to use are what's available in your community. CBT is not often given as CBT. It's watered down stuff. Um, you know, the other thing, there just may be no therapy available, rural areas and areas that are hard to reach, different reasons. And then there's also patient preference and what the child or adolescent and parents want. The other thing that we learned is over the six-month follow-up, and these data are analyzed now, and my colleague John Piacentini has taken the lead on writing this up for us, um, is that at week 24, everybody maintained their gains. In fact, they got a little better. And the same thing out six months. So the treatments, what happened here is they saw their therapist once a month. There was no more increase of medication. They just stayed stable. And the CBT therapist kept reviewing the skills once a month that the kids had learned. And, every, and, you know, and they continued to do OK. But this begs the question, then what? Because the, the parents ask, what do we start with? What should we do? And then the next thing, how long should we keep at it? So we don't know. We know that they did well, but we don't know. And then the third question is, what's going to happen when treatment stops? And we don't have the answers to these questions either based on this study, but we need to do a study like that. Hopefully, we'll be able to. Now, here's a lot of what we're going to focus on this afternoon rests with, we got a response. Those kids were better. But the thing about it is, is when we do studies, typically the studies funded by the government and also in different industry, they focus on symptom improvement. The anxiety got better. Anxiety went away. Um, but it's not 
so much of a focus. You don't report as your primary outcomes functioning. So there still may have been, and we're looking at that now as best as we can with these data, and actually we have a five-year follow-up going. We just started of these children and teenagers from CAMS. Um, we're looking at how was functioning. Did they actually get back into the world and out in the way that they should? Were they going to school? Were they calling up friends? Were they sleeping in their own beds consistently? Functioning is important. And then the other thing that we never have addressed in any of these studies done is developmentally, are they on target? Now, here's a question. How many people here have children? Okay, I want you to think of your kids. And for those of you who don't have children, I want you to think about yourself as a child. Think of the developmental milestones and when your child reached them. When you have young children and when you have kids and you go to a doctor, they ask you about developmental milestones. And when you present to a mental health professional, they're going to ask about developmental milestones. And what do people report? And what are you thinking of? What milestones do you think of? Walking, talking, toilet training, right? What else? What about the milestones for a 10-year-old, 12-year-old, 16-year-old? We don't even know. Can you even name what they're supposed to be? We don't think about them. We think about development in terms of he's walking, he's talking, he's potty trained, and he can Velcro his own shoes. <laughs> but they're not done. So this is very important. None of these studies that, hey, I was one of the you know, investigators on this one. We don't pay attention to developmental milestones. And in fact, you hardly hear about them anymore after a certain age, usually five, six. Then you don't hear much about them. But there's a period of life coming where milestones are really important, and it's called adolescence. Adolescence has been termed the period of storm and stress. That was G. Stanley Hall back in 1909, and they left it at that. <laughs> Your kid's going to throw a major tornado or hurricane, and you got to ride it out. That's adolescence. But in fact, a lot's going on during this period of time. And we do know based on the normal fear data, and we also know about anxiety disorders, adolescence is a time when anxiety increases. It kicks, it's a supercell waiting to happen, right? Um, complex social cognitive skills are developing. So now instead of just being me, me, me as a little kid is, they're me, 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 but other people might not be thinking the way about me that they should. So it causes anxiety. And they're thinking about things from different perspectives. And they're also, so they're able to compare themselves to other, others. And they're also starting to think about consequences, not just in, if I do this, I get my reward, or reinforcer, but if I do this, what are people going to think? What opportunities are going to be shut down? Where am I going to go? What happens next? What responsibility does this put on me? Are they going to be expecting this from me all the time? They start to think about consequences in, in a more long-term way, in a more convoluted way. Um, peer group approval is becoming important. You're, you've got an identity that you're going into high school with and solidifying in terms of the type of people you hang with. Hopefully you're hanging with someone. Maybe you're not. That's a problem by the peer group and by others around you. Academic demands are increasing. It's no coincidence that generalized anxiety disorder, we call it the disorder of middle school. <laughs> I had a, a child I worked with in Albany, New York, and Albany gets cold, really cold. And I had a child who had a backpack on that I don't think, you know, S you know Sir Hillary you know, used that backpack to climb Mount Everest. It was so huge. It had everything in it. This child was so afraid of forgetting something that they might need in school, including a stapler. But the other thing is, they wouldn't, this child would not wear a coat in the middle of winter. 
because to go to the locker and unlock the locker, put the code in, would delay the child from getting to class on time. And of course, putting anything in the locker, but what if they forgot what they need for that class? So this, this was a, a middle schooler who was referred by a chiropractor because this child had very serious back problems, but it was driven by anxiety and carrying things all over the place. So as academic demands increase and stuff, kids start worrying about more about what they have to accomplish, what they have to do. We are putting more, we're asking them to, to and they have to be doing these things a little more independently. Social functioning of all different levels is expected and in all different areas. And then there's that thing called puberty. <laughs> now an interesting thing, a colleague, Chris Hayward, is a physician out at Stanford University. He's done a number of studies that show that teenagers of advanced, pub or adolescents, advanced puberly, pubertally as compared with their peers have a greater tendency of having panic attacks and are more likely to develop panic disorder. Now, but here's a question. Well, the early developers tend to be more panicky. Now, let's think about this. Let's imagine a seventh grade girl who physically is advanced as compared to her peers. What's going on? Is she going to be treated the same way as those peers by kids in the class and the, those around her? Are the eighth grade boys going to be paying a little more attention to her than others? <laughs> The thing here is, while there are maybe some biological mechanisms at play, there's also social mechanisms at play for kids and the way that they are developing puber pubertally. So Chris is working on this long-term studies on pubertal mechanisms, and they're both biological and then environmental reactions to them and how they line up um, in terms of risk for different anxiety disorders and then also for other kinds of issues. Yes? Well, mm -hmm. well, it's more middle school to high school that's the fitting in and you know uh, type of anxiety that occurs, and we're looking at children uh, across the board, um, the the tendency to have more anxiety depending on certain risk factors. Then when you look at specific groups, children with certain disabilities, children with certain medical conditions such as asthma, let's say, and others then there are different rates of anxiety within those groups. Um, and in some conditions, they're approximating what the general population experiences, and some there may be more. It depends. But again, there, you know, it's, it's gonna be more individualized focus. And depending upon, you know, we haven't studied that specifically within our programs, but there are people, for instance, a colleague up at um, University of Wisconsin, Marsha Slattery works with kids with allergies, asthma, and, and, um, uh, and uh, even eczema and things like that, you know, because there are uh, interesting biological similarities to the processes involved there as well as to anxiety. Um, so there's, there's different things that go on in that way. And there's been study of some learning disabilities aggregating more towards anxiety, ADHD, and things like that. Um, so, but I'm talking more of general um, and not specific populations that may have had a different type of disability that sets them apart in that way. Yes? Um, have you noticed, I guess, the difference? Kids seem to be developing earlier, um, are getting a lot more information than they used to, that a lot of these anxieties are starting younger? Well, the question is, are these anxieties starting younger? And the data don't necessarily say that they're starting younger. Um, but that doesn't mean that they were intense, not more intense when they start. But it does, we haven't seen that shift yet mm -hmm. in these latest epidemiological surveys that are coming out. But you know, you gotta remember cohort shifts and things like this mm -hmm. takes a little time for these things to happen, so we'll see. But I'm gonna tell, but we're gonna talk about the, you know, how many different avenues anxiety could come at you these days mm -hmm. as compared, and look, there's been high profile, serious, horrible cases of bullying resulting in suicides in teenagers and young adults. 
Um, there's a lot of relational aggression that goes on using social media and things like that. And it's really terrible. Um, and it has implications for a lot of issues in a adolescent development, um, not just for the anxiety disorders, but others too. So we'll talk about some of that because there's some interesting finding uh, I want to talk about with specifically the internet as we move along. Um, anxiety boy wreaks havoc on teenagers when it's at its problematic levels. Kids who withdraw because of anxiety, then we could say a similar thing for children, teenagers with depression, but in anxiety you're really trying to hide. In depression you're you're too sad, you're too not interested, you're too hopeless. It's a different process, it's a different emotional experience, but a similar behavioral response of withdrawing away. Here is a little bit more of an active avoidance. You're actively seeking to stay out of the focus of others' attention or, or of certain situations that cause you to be uncomfortable. As you do that, Peer relationships suffer. Think this way. Think back again to when you were a ninth grader or an eighth grader. I want you to think back to your eighth grade class. That's an adolescent still. Make a list in your mind of who from your class you would invite to your birthday party. So who's on your list of invitees? Think about who you are not inviting. Who are the kids not getting an invite? Okay, so you got your kids who are inviting and your kids who aren't. Now in all likelihood, the kids you're inviting are the easygoing and nice kids, kids who are fun, and the kids you're not inviting, actively not inviting, are the ADHD conduct oppositional kids. <laughs> but there's a third list. And the third list, who's the kid or kids you forgot about? They didn't make either list because you don't think of them. The list that's in are called the peer accepted kids. The list that you wrote out are the peer rejected kids. And the kids who didn't make a list are the peer neglected kids. You go to a school at recess, to do an observation. There's kids mixing it up. There's kids struggling and fighting. And then there's the one kid along the side of the playground just walking by themselves. Or they're sitting with a book. Or they didn't even come outside. They're sitting inside still at their desk. The peer neglected child. And typically these are the anxious kids. They're not putting themselves out into these situations to be a part of the mix, and we'll talk about this as we go along, but their relationships suffer over time. 